muted. Good. Okay, so so um, we continue today with uh, uh, with the topic of um, uh, gender balanced public law. Uh, Chetina has noticed that um, Marco and I um, are very much coordinated with our outfits. So she has. Uh-huh, okay. <laughs> so Chetina has noticed that Marco and I are uh, coordinated with our, with, without uh, outfits, which is very pertinent, I think, <laughs> for the topic as well. And um, we are not only coordinated with our outfits, but also with the topics. I was supposed to speak the first. Um, however, I had, and it would have made more sense uh, had I spoken first. Uh, because it's more of an introductory um, uh, topic. Uh, but uh, it was also good that uh, Marco started first because he rightly uh, drew attention to um, to some of the things that uh, I was speaking um, last week and uh, also of the things that I will speak today. Um, I think the videos were also very, the discussion which preceded were also very, uh, were also very rich and um, very, very pertinent. Um, it shows, uh, the videos uh, spoke, um, or at least the German video, uh, the Deutsche Welle video, which spoke of um, situation in Germany, in France, and other countries, um, um, pointed at the fact that um, there are still many obstacles to be reached on a cultural level uh, when it comes to, to gender equality. And also, it speaks um, of how these cultures, uh, these now not cultures in terms of gender equality, but now in terms of legal patterns of behavior, are different as compared to ours. We see how it is difficult to actually introduce quotas in these societies, and how um, uh, these cultures, these legal and political cultures are very, very sensitive when it comes to changing the laws. And it is also because once you change the law, you actually apply it. So uh, there is lots of fighting at the stage of reaching the consensus as to what the law should be like. But then when it is introduced, it is generally applied. Um, there are also exceptions in that in that respect. Um, as compared to our situation, uh, and I uh, conducted the research also on um, uh, a wider research on juridical and judicial culture, not only in Serbia, but uh, um, uh, together with my colleagues uh, from Albania and North Macedonia, we studied the legal culture in these other countries. And we all noticed uh, similar patterns of behavior. So that... Um, uh, one of those things was that we are very easy, uh, it's very simple actually to change the laws, but when we do it, we don't do it sincerely. We don't actually, and sometimes we don't do it with even understanding what we did. So there is, lo there is very little discussion at, as to um, what are the subject matters and what we want to actually to achieve. Um, this topic is... Um, as I said, complementary to, to what we were speaking uh, last week and this week. So, I mean, all the topics are um, interrelated. Um, in particular, last week I spoke of the uh, differences in perception of human rights when it comes to gender equality. How we need to uh, actually look at the human rights from another angle in order to accommodate gender equality and equality understood not only in formal terms, but in, in the sense of social reality. Um, today, we will look at those things, but again, from another perspective, from the pers from, mo from a more, more global perspective of the public law in general. <clears throat> And of course, we will refer to some of the examples and the cases that we also discussed last week. Um, what I want to draw your attention to is that um, we have gone different stages of public law um, uh, and you know, the, the realm of public law is very broad. 
Um, it is the the law which regulates the um, organization and functions um, of um, uh, uh, state institutions on different level. Um, so. My dear colleague Marco teaches administrative law, I teach constitutional law, and uh, in that sense, uh, uh, these, these lectures are interrelated and co mutually complementary. Um, so it governs the functioning of the state bodies on different levels, and it also governs the um, of relationships between the citizens and the state. So these are the, the, the big topics uh, of, the, of the public law. In that sense, we also look at the things from the position of the individuals, from the position of the citizens. And sometimes the citizens are not only individuals, uh, citizens in terms of uh, political actors and uh, subjects. Uh, they're also sometimes groups. And those groups can be also women. Uh, in as much as they can be cultural groups, uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, etc. Um, <clears throat> public law as well um, regulates uh, to some extent, but not fully, private law, because it is through public law institutions that we adopt laws which are relevant to um, private, um, uh, to, to the interrelationships between, uh, uh, private interrelationships between individuals and groups. Now, the, the law that we have right now when it comes to gender equality has passed through different stages. Um, and at the moment when the modern public law appeared and we um, take the period of um, uh, 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 great revolutions, uh, bourgeois revolutions of the late um, 18th century, and in England, um, it started even earlier with late 17th century. We trace back the development of modern public law. Um, we will see that that modern public law was very homocentric. So uh, at the stage, at the moment when um, uh, we were speaking of um, uh, coming to the political scene of people, people were not women. So we were speaking of people coming to the political stage, of people taking the power, of the uh, bourgeois revolutions, but those revolutions didn't bring women to power, they brought men to power. Um, then we can see that with time through 19th century, and particular in the first half of the 20th century, um, a public law became started becoming actually gender neutral. So it wasn't any more homocentric. It became gender gender neutral, and we will see that it was a stage when we um, perceived the things in a way that women and men should be treated equally, but only in the formal sense, and without taking in the into consideration the specificities of men of women. I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, in comparison to the uh, to the uh, birth of the public law, where uh, differences between men and women uh, were considered as um, as uh, as legitimate for the unequal treatment of men and women, we came to the stage of gender neutral public law where we considered that these indifferences. Um, that these differences between men and women should uh, disappear and that we should treat men and women equally. Whereas um, in the current stage, uh, and this is why quotas are important and are part of that discussion, we um, take into account that actually um, the differences between men and women should be actually um, uh, a reason for the equal treatment, which accommodates those differences when they are legitimate and when they are justified. And this is why we are um, in that mental state that we uh, are not sure whether quotas are a way of uh, humiliating women or are a way of uh, advantaging women. Um, and we don't know how to position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, gender sensitive uh, language. 
uh, and uh, there are there are a lot of uh, I would say um, uh, there are a lot of uh, um, dilemmas about that uh, among the population of every of every social and uh, I would say um, um, academic um, uh, stage. By the way, if you have any questions or comments. For you who are in the room and those who are online, uh, Anna, Anna will also help us to uh, uh, read us those questions. But I would also encourage those who are online to um, pose their questions orally because it, um, it, uh, it helps the discussion and um, it, um, uh, it, it's more, um, it clarifies better the, the, the position of those who have the questions rather than to read those questions. Um, what is what is particularly important to understand in this process um, of the development of public law is that it led it went towards the um, disappearance of the clear distinction that we had in the beginning between the public and private realm when it comes to gender equality, which means that state has to take more action in the private realm as compared to what it was the case before. So these are the, uh, um, these are the key points of the, of the today's presentation. Um, yeah. Um, so the birth of the, what we have to, what we have to understand is why the public law in the first stages was um, homocentric and why that public law was based on the clear delineation between public and private realm and particularly why that public realm was very, very much limited. So public realm, public, public sphere of action was very much, very much limited when we speak uh, even of the 19th century and uh, uh, actually uh, all up until the First World War. Um, the first, <clears throat> the state, <laughs> when we look sociologically and historically how the state appears, um, we see that the state appears um, firstly as a sort of a, of a military organization because uh, we uh, start uh, organizing ourselves in a state in those forms of relationships which are hierarchical, which are regulated, which uh, transcend, go beyond the um, usual relationships between the families and between uh, wider groups of population which are interrelated by blood, where the relationships are, as they are usually in families, fundamentally horizontal. Um, we um, start uh, organizing ourselves in order to protect ourselves from those who would like to attack us from the outside. So from those um, uh, social factors, political factors who are, um, uh, uh, who, who we perceive as a threat and a danger. But also we have to organize ourselves, um, especially in those, uh, uh, you know, early ages of history, in order to master the nature better. You know, if we need to use the river in order to irrigate the fields so that we can um, uh, cultivate the, 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 the land. Um, uh, and in other instances where we need to control the nature, uh, we actually uh, are obliged to organize ourselves in a kind of a military organization. Later on, the state becomes um, the state becomes uh, also um, a form of organization which protects us from inside because we see that um, individuals can hurt individuals, and we need to organize our state not only as a military organization but also as a sort of police and judicial organization to resolve the internal conflicts. And for many many years and many many actually uh, centuries state did not go beyond those basic functions. Um, so this is what, what we mean by um, an absolutist um, a, a liberal, um, for, uh, what we mean um, a, a switch um, from a religious to secular state and from an absolutist to liberal state. Um, uh, 
the liberal state, this is position of the liberal state as well. Absolute state, the monarchies, absolute um, monarchies which existed before these big revolutions, these great revolutions, were also uh, limited in terms of their uh, intervention in the private realm, intervention in the society and markets. Um, that was the principle of liberal state, the, that, the in that the invisible hand um, uh, of... of um, uh, uh, of, of market should regulate the economy by itself. Um, and so we consider that it should be left to the private parties, to the um, enterprises, to the um, companies and to individuals to regulate most of the things which are um, within, uh, within the private sphere. So this is one reason of the clear distinction between public and private law. Uh, for Many centuries it was like that, and even with the liberal theory and with, with liberalism, which rightly insisted on the rights of individuals, those rights of individuals were supposed to be achieved in the private realm. Um, another reason, which is particularly important for the understanding of the of the gender equality and uh, for those um, for the cultural aspects of of why we reason in the way we reason is the fact that um, religion uh, was relegated uh, uh, to the private sphere as well. So um, uh, the modern state is actually built up on the fight between the absolute monarchs and, uh, and the church. I mean, absolute monarchies appeared as a result of the, um, um, uh, of the struggle of the uh, of the monarchs who were not initially sovereigns in the in the in the um, uh, in the feudal period, um, who were just um, um, uh, one among other lords, but slightly distinguished in comparison to other barons and other secular lords. So monarchs were threatened by other lords uh who had their own territories and who their, had their own privileges but they were also threatened by the church because the church wanted to actually seize the uh, not only the uh, spiritual sword but also the secular sword so they wanted to actually church wanted to meddle into the spiritual into the secular sphere of life as well so absolute monarchy uh meant a process in which the um uh, the establishment actually of modern states, of sovereign states, implied that monarchs were those who were sovereign, uh, and they were sovereign with respect to the uh, lords and other individuals uh, on their territory, but also with respect to the church, which wanted to meddle into the into their sphere, sphere of, of uh, realm of power. Um, so, gradually, religion, not at the first stage, but then gradually, and especially after the bourgeois revolutions, um, uh, uh, be because uh, church was supporting actually those uh, aristocratic and monarchical uh, trends and currents in the society, the bourgeois bourgeoisie had an interest to actually suppress the religion to the private sphere. Um, uh, actually, I mean, religion was already present in the private sphere, but now the point was to take it away from the public sphere. Um, that way, the clear distinction between public and private was made. So what I said here, I don't know why this thing is so... Uh -huh. Okay, no, no, I want to go back. <laughs> um, this is why, this is why um, not only... A free market relations were reserved for the private sphere, um, uh, but also the private sphere is a private domain of family and marital relations. And uh, religious um, uh, views, uh, beliefs, um, um, religious customs um, reinforced the dominant position of man in the family and the subordination of woman to man in the family. And interestingly, uh, although we had a gradual, as I said, 
um, uh, seizure of power by uh, people. Those people were men. So uh, they were on the stage, the lights were on them, whereas women stayed behind in the private sphere, in the darkness, actually, of that uh, kind of life. And um, the Napoleon Code, which we celebrate as a very... Uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an expression of enlightenment, considered women as um, lifelong minors. So they were lifelong, they were considered as minors in terms of their status, in public and in private. So um, the point is that this <laughs> distinction between public and private um, not only uh, had as a consequence to subordinate women, women to uh, the, the private sphere, that the public sphere was actually not accessible to them. But it also had as a consequence of further empowerment of man. Uh, man was in the public, he was visible and active, but he was also um, very much relevant in the private, being uh, considered as dominant in the private. It empowered him as well in the public sphere because uh, there was a woman at home who was doing the work which he didn't have to work, he, which he didn't have to do. So cleaning, house, children, um, sexual needs, that was the role of women, of, of, of women. Whereas men had um, that share of the cake in as much as he wanted it. But he also had the rest of the uh, another cake, the whole cake for himself, which is the public sphere. We see that inequalities um, which are based um, uh, on differences are treated as legitimate. So there are uh, there are differences. Uh, I uh, I uh, took example uh, last week of. Um, of, um, of professors of constitutional law in the 19th century, <clears throat> which spoke, who spoke, for example, um, in con the context of the French Second Republic in 1848, that finally the, 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 the suffrage became general. But of course, it meant only men, not women. So they celebrated the, 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 the suffrage became uh, general, but they didn't even think that that, that suffrage could apply to women as well, because they perceive the difference, differences between men and women. Um, and uh, the, the inequalities which were based on those differences were treated as legitimate. So it was perfectly legitimate not to um, grant women a status in the public realm. Even later, um, another professor from, from Belgium, um, uh, professor of constitutional law, also uh, claimed that there are situations where uh, uh, differences um, are uh, uh, a legitimate, legitimate ground to treat people uh, inequally. And he took the example of sex, the differences based on the sex. It, that difference uh, is a legitimate reason to treat people um, inequally. We also, we will come to the present stage, we also think that... Um, uh, only equal things should be treated equally and that unequal things should be treated unequally. But our perspective of um, uh, uh, what should be equal has significantly changed from that period then. Because we now, uh, and this is what happened in the second stage, where we had a gender neutral public law, uh, which started basically um, uh, uh, with... Um, Introduction of uh, female suffrage in the in the in some American states and some Scand Scandinavian states in the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, and in particular there was the first wave of spreading of that right after the First World War, uh, among other things due to the participation of women in the First World War, but also uh, for the reason of the uh, of the fear of the spread 
of the um, uh, socialist revolution from the east to the west. So the socialist, uh, the Bolshevik re revolution, which took into account differences and uh, considered that uh, those differences um, uh, where certain parts of population um, were um, previously um, illegitimately, uh, unrightly treated uh, differently should now lead to the equal treatment of uh, everyone, including of some groups. This included uh, recognition of right to vote to women. Um, but also, for example, in the context of, uh, of the Bolshevik Socialist Revolution in the USSR um, and the creation of the USSR, it also uh, meant the creation of the uh, ethnic federation, uh, where ethnicities were given the status of federal units because they were considered as previously suppressed in the Tsarist Russia. How much that was <laughs> applied and achieved in reality, that's another thing, because uh, we know uh, later on from the history that that kind of federalism was only facade uh, federalism. Um, and this, uh, again, speaks of the uh, specificities of the legal and political cultures, where we introduce things into the law without actually believing fully uh, into it or without proper consensus and without um, a proper understanding um, uh, on all relevant um, uh, uh, strata of the society of the need to do those kind of changes. So the dialogue, the discussion, the pedagogy is very much important. Um, in that stage, um, um, uh, the political and civil uh, equality claims were based on the similarities between sexes. So we insisted actually on the similarities between uh, sexes, sexes, um, and we, uh, the feminists, um, insisted on the uh, formally equal treatment of uh, of the formal equal treatment of men and women. So the women, exactly what we heard in the video, should not be recognized any quotas because women um, are. Um, uh, equal to men, and uh, any kind of uh, advantaging in that sense would be considered as a sign of inferiority, because you are giving something to someone, and that's seen as a sign of inferiority. We also see that kind of um, uh, sort of um, uh, dilemma and uh, not clear ideas when it comes to celebration of the 8th of March, for example, and there are women who refuse to, to accept uh, the 8th of March, uh, uh, to be celebrated because they, they consider it to be insulting. And there are other women who, um, actually, uh, behave, I would say, in a, in a more stereotyped, stereotyped way when it comes to treating that kind, that, uh, that, um, uh, public, uh, or not necessarily a public, but a holiday. Um, so, um, uh, we introduce, for example, female suffrage in the legislation without any quotas. Um, um, and then we saw, uh, Marco's lecture showed that as well, that nothing changed in the, in the, in the um, composition of the parliaments because um, uh, that was obviously not enough to recognize formal equality. Uh, exactly because, first of all, there was the persistence of inequalities in the civil law field. And it is the civil law field and family that we firstly come from. So this is where we are uh, brought up. This is where we are born, brought up. Uh, these are the first forms of the socialization. Uh, so socialization, different forms of socialization, and we'll talk about that, are extremely important. And uh, um, the... Relationships in the family are uh, of the foremost importance in that sense because the, the types of roles and um, uh, identities that we adopt in the families mm, uh, very much, I won't say that it uh, excludes the um, uh, and lessens the influence of other forms of socialization, but it very much influences our way of thinking, our way of understanding of the roles in the family and the roles between men and women. Um, so what is interesting is that in the civil law, the differences persisted in law. The differences persisted in law. So, for example, um, 
uh, Germany introduced uh, 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 introduced um, uh, female suffrage um, in the uh, Weimar uh, Constitution of 1919. Um, uh, and then it was, of course, repeated and uh, confirmed in the in the Bonn Constitution, of, uh, in the Grundgesetz of 1949. But um, even in Germany, and not to speak of some Asian and African countries, uh, the civil law differences persisted up until 50s and 60s. So um, this is, as I said, very much important because um, you, when you even when you have an opportunity to come to the public stage as a woman or as a, as a, as a man, uh, you already come with certain ideas. And um, uh, uh, if we uh, keep those differences in civil law, they're going to persist even longer in the culture. So as we have seen, it's not so much, it's not so much difficult to change the law in as much as it is difficult to change uh, cultural patterns of behavior. Um, so the we have understood that we need to change something and to be more proactive in, in reaching uh, gender equality. Um, gender equality in the sense that um, everyone has opportunity to express um, uh, himself, herself, or uh, in a non-binary um, way as well, um, in a way that he or she thinks uh, it will be very much determined determined by the sex, and it will also be determined in another way by the sexual orientation. But gender um, identity doesn't uh, fall into any of these categories. So sex and sexual orientation influences uh, gender identity in as much as other factors like religion, like culture, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is why it is important to um, take into account uh, these, uh, as we said, macro concepts like uh, culture and religion um, uh, uh, to, um, in order to enable individuals to um, express themselves in the way in which they in, in the way in which they wish to express themselves. Uh, on, of course, providing they don't harm the other. So that's the principle, no harm to others. Um, and in order to allow individuals to express themselves, um, we need to, um, to see the differences between the uh, genders um, in a way in which they will not disadvantage them, the differences. Um, so we need to also um, recognize those legitimate differences. And this is the point of, of the wide spectrum of gender equality, of the gender identity. It's a very wide spectrum and it's up to everyone to choose where he or she or it wants to be placed. Um, to choose the roles which he, which he or she wants to perform, provided that we don't harm the other in the performance of those roles. Um, and exactly because, Marco was speaking of the argument of justice, exactly because for many, many centuries, women were placed in the position of injustice, we need to take additional measures to improve their position in the uh, culture, in the, uh, in the ways of uh, thinking, in the patterns of behavior. Um, and that we can do through law. And also we can do, uh, as we will see, through raising um, public awareness, conscious awareness, uh, by education, by uh, trainings such as these trainings, and um, unfortunately they uh, come to supplement and to um, actually not even supplement, but to um, to substitute the education, which should, should be uh, the, a place where we should primarily speak of these things. Um, also, uh, the role of media um, and um, um, and uh, other forms of social uh, um, uh, of social integration and so socialization should have to be taken into account. Uh, <clears throat> so we understand that um, if we want to value um, those differences um, when they are um, provided, that those differences um, 
are a form of sincere expression of, uh, of the individuals, and at the same time that they don't harm the others, that they also treat the others with full respect. Um, we need to overcome the formal equality by reaching the substantial equality. And um, that part of um, correlating equality to differences, so that um, equality should allow for the legitimate expression of differences, led also to the public uh, recognition of non-binary uh, non -binary gender. So um, um, it is important to understand that um, uh, there are people who um, do not feel uh, neither and don't consider themselves neither in terms of their sex or their gender, um, neither as men nor as, as women. Uh, if we take <laughs> some stereotypical understandings of what is a, a man on one side and what is a woman on the other side. Now, uh, would anyone of you would like to um, say what you think, uh, what is a transgender and what is a, um, intergender, intersex or transsex or intersex? There are, there are different terms. Uh, sometimes we use, uh, uh, usually we use these terms, transgender and intergender. Or we can as well use, as I said, transsex and uh, intersex. Transsexual and intersexual identity. Anyone online who would like to? So Lucia? I have one. Um, Lucia says, person, would you like to take a floor, Lucia? Okay, we have some difficulties. Good. I mean, unfortunately. Uh, yes. Uh, just a second, Lucia, because uh, we, we, we're still, uh, sorry, just a second, we're still uh, facing uh, problems. Okay. Okay, so it appears we have some, uh, I don't know, some, some, some pr uh, problem with your, uh, with your computer, if I understood well. And you have rightly said that, uh, uh, if I understood from your message, that uh, transgender, a person who wants to transfer to other sex, yes, or... Um, uh, yes, because there are, there are people who um, are born with, um, uh, with anatomy, of uh, one sex, of male or female sex, they have the anatomy, a body, physical traits and characteristics of one um, of one sex, uh, male or, or or female, but who do not uh, feel um, male or female in terms of their uh, uh, identity, gender identity, in terms of um, how they perceive themselves. Um, also admitting and taking into account that there are many, many <laughs> differences between the stereotypical understandings of what is male and female. Um, so, but what is clear is that these people understand that um, uh, they are imprisoned in their body because their body does not reflect, let's say, uh, their feelings, their, uh, see, the way they see themselves. So these people have a need to uh, change their um, um, uh, uh, anatomy, um, to change their sexual uh, traits, and sometimes uh, physical characteristics, uh, attributes, and sometimes it is achieved through um, um, hormonal treatments, and sometimes it is achieved through uh, surgery. And of course, um, it never takes place before we previously go through um, a, a, a session of uh, psychological um, uh, uh, observation and treatment and discussion and counseling in order to be sure that um, uh, that that kind of intervention is needed and that that person will be f happy finally with uh, with uh, with his body. Um, so there is, there is, there is a, that kind of situation, but there is also a kind of situation of intersex where uh, people are born with the physical attributes of two, um, of the two sexes. So we can't say on the basis of the physical attributes, uh, whether those are, um, men or women, um, uh, because from the outside, th their anatomy shows one sex from the inside. 
anatomy shows another sex or um, they may have um, um, chromosomes uh, in their cells, which are in some cells XX and in some cells are XY. So um, there are um, these kind of situations and uh, 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 this is why we speak of non-binary gender. So binary is when we know it is under one or another, but there are also situations of non-binary gender. And um, in Germany, for example, um, a case was brought before the German Constitutional Court uh, in which the person claimed that its uh, dignity was, was violated because in the birth registry books, um, that person had to um, declare itself either as man or um, a, a woman. I mean, the declaration was made by the parents when that person was born, and that person was... Uh, um, was uh, was defined as uh, as a woman, uh, but it it turned out that that person has a had a, a chromosome uh, issue and that um, it had a t Turner syndrome. So um, later on in life, that person understood that uh, um, uh, its identity was not clear and obvious, and um, it considered that the birth registry, which only um, recognizes. Um, uh, binary identities. Um, yes, it's true. Lucia uh, Turner syndrome is is uh, more often with uh, with with people who have physical uh, attributes of women. Um, so they uh, she, that person asked for uh, the change of the categories in the in the registry book, and uh, the registry uh, the service uh, refused to do that. So that person went up. Uh, uh, up uh, until the constitutional court, the German federal constitutional court, and then the court um, relied on Article uh, Two, um, Paragraph One of the German uh, Basic Law, which um, uh, guarantees right to personal um, um, uh, liberty and uh, and 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 um, to a liberty of a person, and um, um, the court considered that. Um, that liberty of a person um, concerns both the public and private realm of life and that this person could not achieve its basic rights and be considered and accepted as a legitimate member of the society, um, neither in the public nor in the pri private realm, because uh, of the fact that the birth registry um, um, books did not recognize its specificity. Um, so... Um, Sorry. We have one question. Oh, yeah, sure, please. To, to interrupt you. Okay, so we have one question in the chat saying, should quotas be made for transgender people and non-binary people as well? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a right question. Um, I think that we should try at this stage, we are, we are, we are going gradually towards the... Um, um, towards the achievement of the su substantial equality. So we have gone, you know, a long road from the, let's say, just a couple of years before the big, revol the great revolutions, where again, the differences in social status were considered as legitimate. So inequality was considered as legitimate. You were born as a peasant, die, you, sh you shall stay as a peasant, you know. You were born as an aristocrat, you're going to be an aristocrat. So um, the, 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 tra the, the possibility of changing your social status was not uh, easy to, to achieve. Um, I do think that, um, so we see, and now I will give a couple of examples, we'll pass to the discussion, we'll, we'll pass on to the discussion. We will see how it is difficult to overcome um, the, the cultural uh, uh, stereotypes that we are blocked in. Um, when it comes to just equality of women who um, um, are a majority uh, in, uh, in our societies. Um, so um, I do think that we should uh, uh, consider um, uh, ways of uh, representation, and they don't have to be quotas. There are other ways to improve the position of uh, um, of transgender and in intergender uh, people. 
Um, first of all, they should be encouraged to express themselves. Uh, and we should, in that sense, um, have a better um, understanding through their uh, coming into the public as to... Um, uh, uh, we should hear them and we should s s uh, try to understand what are the, uh, what, their, what are their specific needs, um, and whether, uh, it presupposes also a particular representation in the parliament, for example. Um, so, uh, that is, that is, um, uh, something to be taken into account for sure. In as much as, um, and this is a topic for that Marco and I could also uh, dwell upon together in the future and the topic which is also uh, discussed, for example, should we allow for quotas when it comes to women in other spheres of public life, such as judiciary and prosecutor's office? Should we have quotas in that field as well? Um, and in other spheres also when it comes to public, uh, public realm, realm and public institutions. Now, um, can you just, uh, yeah, sure, sure. Mark. Uh, uh, just open your mic here. Yeah. Yes, just one sentence. Uh, I'm not sure about other uh, courts, but when we speak about administrative court, uh, we should definitely yeah. have quotas for men. Yeah. Because uh, I think 85 or 90 percent of uh, judges in administrative court, yeah. Yeah. courts yeah. Are, are or are women. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so, sorry, Marco. Again, this is uh, again uh, an example of. Uh, um, of a discussion which is um, transposed from the Western world to uh, to Serbia or uh, our region, Balkans, because this is not exactly the problem that we are facing. But the point is that by bringing more women to the public realm, um, we will eventually hear all those different voices which are, let's say, more typical for the female side of the spectrum in comparison to the uh, uh, male side of the spectrum. Because what we see, it, it is true, we see that uh, there is actually very much of um, 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 masculine understandings of society and concepts which come from some women in the public realm. So it looks actually like uh, it hasn't brought anything. Um, it actually, maybe it has even worsened the situation because it has given uh, another perspective uh, of how it may look like and how you can abuse and how you can actually um, um, destroy an idea and a concept. I, I, I think it would be wrong to perceive things that way, although we are not uh, at the moment happy with the way it functions. Because definitely bringing more women when it comes to a political realm and to the uh, important key making decisions gradually bring what uh, we call in feminist theory um, uh, women's point of view to the agenda, which is a legitimate uh, point of view uh, in as much as it is important to have a, a man's point of view and to have a point of view of children and of all other um, identities that we may find. Um, it is important to actually have um, at, the, at the end of the story um, um, not uh, necessarily women in the parliament, but feminist approach to the uh, policies. And yes, feminist approach to policies can be also advocated by men. There is no problem about that. Uh, but um, we need to hear also uh, women and their voices in order to, um, uh, also in order for, for the men to understand better their needs and to be able to take on that torch uh, uh, of, um, of their equality. Um, now, I would like to give some uh, few examples um, for the discussion, just to show how we are still uh, struggling with some basic terms and concepts. Um, Istanbul Con Con Convention was uh, adopted in 2011. I would remind you, uh, it's a convention uh, for the fight against uh, um, violence and discrimination against women and domestic violence. Um, the, the, the violence against women is defined in that convention um, as uh, all acts of gender-based violence 
Um, so it's violence based on gender, based on um, with a discriminatory purpose or with a purpose of violating human rights because someone is of one gender uh, and not of another. Um, that result or in or are likely to result in physical, sexual, psychological or economic harm or suffering to women. <coughs> Um, so we see that uh, that violence uh, can take different shades uh, and it's not just uh, um, physical or sexual as we would understand it, uh, but it can be uh, also psychological or economic. Um, and in order to eradicate those um, forms of behavior, parties are obliged to promote changes in the social and cultural patterns of behavior of women and men with a view to eradicating prejudices, customs, traditions, and all other practices which are based on the idea of the inferiority of women or on stereotyped roles for women and men. So we need to fight against uh, stereotypes and stereotypes understandings of, um, of role of men and women and uh, uh, against the idea on, of the uh, inferiority of uh, of women. So I want to give you a couple of um, examples from the Serbian uh, um, uh, public sphere and to have it as a discussion um, uh, to see what you what you think about it, uh, whether it's uh, problematic or not, uh, and if it is problematic, why it is problematic. Um, so this this uh, this statement of the Serbian former Serbian defense minister is, uh, I think, still very much known, and it's uh, we are reminded of it. Um, at one point uh, in a, uh, uh, in an event which was uh, uh, publicized and which was broadcasted, uh, where uh, journalists came to uh, uh, pose him questions, uh, one of the journalists. Uh, she journalist, she was a woman, she kneeled, and um, we don't know why she kneeled, but this is how she approached him. And um, he commented, oh, uh, I love so much uh, uh, she journalist. So in Serbian, there is a typical uh, uh, word, the distinction between uh, uh, she and male and female journalist. Um, oh, I love so much uh, she journalists who kneel so easily. Um, what would you uh, say about um, this um, um, statement? Is it problematic or not? Is it uh, uh, is the minister allowed to say uh, what he likes? Uh, is this uh, uh, something that we should be disturbed about, or uh, it's um, it's an acceptable um, uh, because there is free speech after all? Would anyone like to comment on it? Just uh, remind me your name. Larissa. Larissa, yes. Yeah, but uh, here we come to the realm of free speech, which, which is so, uh, which is often abused completely mm -hmm. throughout the world. Mm -hmm. So free speech is uh, generally very easily falls into the speech of hatred, so mm -hmm. hate speech. So where are we? I mean, I would also always uh, return to to a first lecture, so free speech, uh, but uh, without violating other person's dignity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which here we mm -hmm. first of all see the violation of dignity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's sexist, it's mis misogynistic, it's of course not appropriate to any formal uh, governmental official or to anyone, I mean formal or informal, even informally it's 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 full of hatred and it's mis would, you, would you be more specific why you think it is uh, uh, misog misog misogynistic uh, because Lucia says as far as I can see in, the, in her comment that it's a late um, um, a latent, a latent hate speech so if I understand you Lucia uh, it's problematic but it's not an open hate speech it's a latent hate speech so would you would you yes. unfortunately we can't hear Lucia but uh, um, she confirms it's a latent and not an open hate speech. Uh, would you, Larissa, be more precise as to what, why you think it's a hate speech, open hate speech? Yeah, because uh, women is um, 
defined here as a commodity, sexual commodity, then can be used and abused very easily um, in the circle of men, in front of men, in front of other people, etc. So that's why I, I think, yeah, it has really deep implications what he said. So sometime, uh, sometimes, I mean, here we enter this realm of law, but since I'm um, also dealing with linguistics and philology and sociolinguistics, not all things that are said uh, uh, are are enough. They're they're implied. Uh, symbolics inside the wording and inside the phrasing which we always need to take into account when when we are uh, expressing ourselves and here I would also like to connect to this uh, patriarch porphyria what he said yeah, come to that. yeah. Worry, but this that, is that, like these implications are uh, it's, it's inside the social linguistics and the, the field of culture and anthropology. So it's not everything. Words are not, uh, how should I say, completely empty phrases. They're signifiers for something very much more complex. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. Thank you, La Larissa. Lucia. Uh, Lucia is also kneeling is often in, um, in women uh, when they want something to get. I think he wanted to say. Sneaky, manipulative uh, woman. Um, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Lucia, I don't know if you have ever uh, seen that scene. Um, um, I, I would agree with uh, what Larissa said. So the scene, uh, the, the scene has to be taken into account. Uh, the context has to be taken into account. But I will also offer to someone else to say more about it if he or she wants or it. So the context is important. Um, it's a mi first. It's a minister, and then there is a journalist. So there is and it's a minister of defense, and uh, there is a journalist on the other side. Um, by the way, a journalist whom we don't really know. I mean, it's not a, a person who has a particularly um, uh, uh, reached some um, some. Yeah, she, she's not. A, she was. She was not a prominent journalist. Um, so th there is that kind of um, uh, power relationship uh, from the outset uh, in the in the, in the stage, um, and then uh, there is a minister who is a man, and there is also a journalist who is a woman. So there is that kind of relationship between uh, male female, um, and as as we have seen, we come from the world which was very homocentric. So where culturally for uh, centuries and centuries, uh, millennium, uh, women were in a subordinate position and that m mentality doesn't change. So whether that was the reason why she was uh, kneeling or not, we don't know. But the mere fact that he is um, applauding uh, that fact that she is kneeling um, and that he's, uh, you know, uh, saying it openly, um, uh, perpetuates those uh, pictures of inferiority and of um, uh, stereotypes of the um, uh, which uh, uh, place women at the lower social strata as compared to men. Okay, we have another. We have another comment. Okay, uh -huh. you want to read? It? Are you not? Um, so it is. Um, what's the name? Imrak. Uh, Imrak. Uh, Imrak. Uh, uh, I don't know the context here, but the violence against press freedom and gender violence go hand in hand in this uh, uh, violence against press freedom and gender violence go hand in hand in the in this discourse. I don't understand if it is our discourse in the room um, or it is in the discourse of the example uh, which is inherent in the, because uh, I. Example. Okay, thank you. <laughs> because yes, I mean, uh, w w we are faced with a problem of uh, of press freedom. I mean, you can put it in that way as well. And uh, th these examples which I give, which show the need for the state to inter intervene. So this is the the um, um, an example where state has to go across the border of what is usually considered as public and private and also to sanction the language, which is considered even in the public realm as something which is legitimate because it is protected by freedom of speech. And freedom of speech is indeed very important 
for the public real, for the reasons that we mentioned also uh, last week, and I won't go back there. Uh, okay, so we have another. Um, uh, good. So we have another example of the another uh, social, um, Serbian minister, and the statement was given at the event of the 8th of March, uh, exactly, when he recited um, a poem of a famous Serbian poet, Jovan Ducic. Um, in um, the quote goes as, as follows: All women love rich men um, because um, she is always poor. Um, they are afraid of those who are wise. She always submits herself to a stronger one and not to a more handsome or wiser, nor to a better or more gentle. Um, so what would you say about this statement? Um, yeah, the poet is, uh, he's a very famous Serbian poet. Uh, no, no, yeah, he's not. not, not no, no, he's, he's not. not. Yeah, he's very probably. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I mean, it's it's it's, it's 19, late 19th century, beginning of 20th century, um, also with the very strong um, nationalistic views and ideas. Um, uh, also, we have to admit a great poet. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, very distinctive, very uh, diplomatic. He was a dip. He was a, uh, Jovan Ducic was a diplomat, and um, he uh, uh, was uh, uh, um, you know he wasn't only his poems are not only um, interwoven with these impressions of uh, of men and women, um, um, and uh, he also was a poet of nature. So he was uh, and also. As I said, he had also very strong political views, and he was in also as an intellectual involved, involved in the politics and um, a nationalist. So uh, let's say Serbian nationalist in that understanding. Um, he was also a, um, he was also a diplomat. Um, so one has to understand that the poem was made. That has to be everything has to be taken into uh, in the context. In the context. The poem, the, po the 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 poem was exactly uh, made in the period, uh, the, in the first stage of the homocentric public law, when we considered that um, there are uh, inequali inequalities between men and women because of the in because of the differences between them, and uh, so that was the that was on the realm in the realm of the public law, but we see also a reflection of those stereotypes in. Okay, I already said it was a stereotype, but I'm sure that you also noticed and felt that there was a stereotype here in the um, in in his words. The problem um, uh, Harnas is not actually in who is the poet, but who, uh, if you allow me, who <laughs> decided to quote this poet in a, such a way um, in the uh, 21st century, maybe um, six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. Tiana raised her hand. So yes, Tiana, Tiana would like to say something? Uh, yes, for me, this is even worse that came from the word, of course, the, the social affairs minister, but also on the day which came this statement, and it's on the Women's Day. Uh, yeah. And it also, uh, it didn't have any effect on his career. He didn't quit his position, which even makes the, the worse, because there's also no political responsibility for his statement. Mm, thank you so much. Uh, it's true, Tiana, and one has to admit that the previous minister was um, was sanctioned by being transferred to uh, another office, another post. Uh, and that was the head of the um, head of the state uh, secret state agency, intelligence agency. Uh, so uh, he was transferred from one position to another. At least for for a while, he was without any function. But later on, he overtook another public function. This minister was never sanctioned publicly, the, although although the commissioner for the protection of equality uh, reacted to these words and she uh, condemned these words as being uh, uh, as stereotyping women. Okay, we are having uh, running around, are running out of time, and I want to share just two more um, examples with you. Um, so something like. Um, 2000, uh, uh, 2018, uh, 2019, we had some, um, um, some, some protests in Belgrade 
uh, in which um, uh, 2019 actually, uh, in which um, uh, uh, protest, protest, protesters were marching um, in front of the in front of the office of the president of the republic, and uh, also in front of the of the of the city hall of Belgrade, and uh, it had uh, it looked at some moments as if they want to enter inside. Um, so, president of the republic uh, stated. Um, in that context, and also reflecting to what was going on in Paris in those days where there were pr protests of uh, Gilets jaunes, the, the yellow um, uh, waste coast, um, who actually uh, were protesting for um, social rights, and their protests were really, we saw it, um, turned uh, Paris, streets of Paris and of other uh, 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 French cities into, into a sort of battlefield. So, a president of the Republic stated, I don't want scenes from Paris. In future, the office of the president will be protect, uh, will protect only women, members of the Serbian army. What do you think about this statement? The fact that he said, I don't want scenes from Paris. In future, the office of the president will protect only, will protect only women, members of the Serbian army. Is this um, this is a more this is a st statement which didn't caught so much attention we, of the? We have a comment from Tiana saying like like that. Like yeah, okay, Tiana, that's um, but maybe you can um, be more explicit as to um, if there was anything wrong in the way Gaddafi uh, behaved by having um, female bodyguards. Yes, he has. Uh, there's a lot of uh, right remarks uh, about the way he behaved to the woman in his guards. A lot of, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, accusation of the woman, the way uh, he behaved to them mm -hmm. as regards. So uh, this even makes like even worse, knowing the history of other uh, presidents who require required only female. But what is the problem to have a female guard? I mean, it's not, uh, isn't that way of uh, uh, giving more space to women and um, uh, giving them place in public? Uh, isn't that uh, exactly what we were talking about? Marco was saying uh, there are very little of, of women at the heads of the Ministry of Defense. Uh, wh why not let the women uh, take this role of uh, this power, uh, this, uh, 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 just a second, I mean, <laughs> let them speak now. Um, so what, what is the problem? I mean, it's, uh, it's exactly the, we, we, we very often, um, point to the fact that women are, uh, uh, that it is the home and family and, uh, a domestic life, which is reserved to them and that they're not sufficiently in the space. And if they're in the space, they're occupy, occupying the position of teachers and, uh, you know, school teachers and, uh, and nurses. And, uh, well, now they have a position to be in the army and to be visible in the army. Isn't that the way of uh, promoting them? What's the problem with it? I want to. I know that you want, but uh, let them, let them. I'll give, no, 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 no. Of course, of course. Okay, Dragic. What Tiana wants to say and what I agree with her upon is there is, and also I, I agree with the implied uh, affirmative part of affirmative statement in, mm -hmm. in what mm -hmm. you said. Of course, there is no problem. That's very good mm -hmm. that women take mm -hmm. part in uh, public occupations, especially army and police, which have been traditionally considered uh, masculine mm -hmm. ones. Mm -hmm. But very problematic mm -hmm. is, I think, according to Tiana's opinion, but also mm -hmm. mine, this... Uh, exclusivity mm -hmm. of women in mm -hmm. his guard mm -hmm. mentioned that's very controversial that very problematic mm -hmm. by definition she, okay. said, she also said it's it looks like male supremacy uh, tina says it looks like male supremacy okay would anyone else like to comment on it 
but could you please give me a context of this? Um, it's kind of uh, taken out of context. You, you don't. I said the context of the pr so the um, protests were in the in the city, um, and uh, they were. Uh, you maybe uh, remember the scenes. Also, what came afterwards were the scenes where some opposition party members were trying to enter the uh, city hall of Belgrade, where the administrative staff of Belgrade City Hall. Uh, exclusively composed of women came to protect the building of the uh, of the city hall. We never had those kind of uh, uh, attacks on the on the presidency, on the building of the president of the republic. But nevertheless, uh, he decided to give this kind of statement following these events, where women were uh, at the forefront of physically protect. I mean, but women administrative staff in the city hall uh, who were at the forefront of uh, protecting the opposition uh, leaders from entering in the city hall by literally coming to the doors and blocking the doors. So um, what, how do you see, is this, uh, uh, I mean, okay, there are some ambiguities in this statement and uh, uh, Dragica and Tiena pointed to the exclusivity of the uh, of, of of his understanding of who should protect him what are the other potential ambiguities uh uh, uh of, of this statement yeah let's serbia lacks in tough men women show their courage to mm -hmm. save me mm -hmm. so women will now protect me only mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. about men you are I don't want to insult, but mm -hmm. I can only imagine because he's very colloquial when he mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. stands up and talks about this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it's a kind of uh, playing mm -hmm. with this uh, issue of masculinity, femininity, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to put down men yeah. from the opposition and other people. So mm -hmm. okay, this and is uh, this is interesting in the context. Uh, yeah, I see uh, many hands uh, in the context of. Uh, uh vis-a-vis -vis the opposition so there is that kind of thing uh vasily raised the hand and and then Mar 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 anna and maria i just wanted to agree to what my colleague just said uh the assumption was uh perhaps uh the use of women as a living shield mm -hmm. uh and that was the mis misuse mm -hmm. then so mm -hmm. in that context i agree but yeah, the use, of, just be said. the use of women as, as a living shield, okay. Uh, Maria? Uh, uh, in a way, I agreed with both of you. Uh, and also, implicitly, it could mean uh, using women as a political tool, meaning if you attack, for example, those three women that were protecting, but women especially, if the opposition does that, then the opposition does not respect women. Mm -hmm. They attacked women. Mm -hmm. They are against women, etc. So I think that was also, in a way, but I say implicitly, because when you read it outside of the context, you don't see that. Mm, there is, but this, this is important, what you said, because... Uh, uh, this, uh, this, this, this implicit understanding, which is between the lines, very much reflects the dominant understanding of who women are and what they are like. Anna? Yes, I wanted to say something similar, like Maria said. It's like a political tool of misusing women. Like, uh -huh. I want to promote women. Uh -huh and do like to do something in a good way mm -hmm, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you attack them then i will use that mm -hmm, as mm -hmm. an argument that uh, for mm -hmm, violence mm -hmm. against women against my opposition so i only see it as a political tool mm -hmm, and not mm -hmm. as an honest promotion of women mm -hmm. in army and whatever mm -hmm. yeah, uh, i just uh, like to add uh, because afterwards i remember this scene he actually named every woman that came to the door to protect him and mm -hmm. then on n1 television you can still see the the, the insert yes, from that but he says, thank you to Masha, Anna, and those brave women who came to protect the government building, etc., or the, the city yeah. hall building, uh, because those men who were attacking them, they were the, they had the, the, the courage to attack not only the city hall, but women. Mm -hmm. And then it was used, but basically just it as, you know, a tool to defense your own policy against the opposition. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it. Uh, it was, I wish that it was used in a different way, yeah. as you said, to give them the role that they yeah. should have in those yeah. places, but it, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Very good, Vasily. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a populist pol politics of um, like presenting this kind of gender equity in a very populist, uh, populist way. That's what he does and downplays actually the, the very essence uh -huh. of, of yeah. that. So. Yeah. Yeah.
You're, you're right. We'll come back to these comments, uh, Vasily. And the regime's intention, uh, Maria spoke about, actually realized when the, one of the opposition leaders uh, from the far right, mm -hmm. uh, right wing uh, spectrum of the political uh, po political parties in Serbia, was accused as. Um, uh, harassment of women and mm -hmm. Boško Bradović mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pointed out as an example of the treatment yeah, of yeah. women uh, Maria spoke about. Yeah, very, very good, Vasily. Uh, so I think th we see that this uh, on um, on the surface of the of the things it may look as a sort of uh, promotion of women, but um, when you when we look at the fact that. Um, the following day, there were no women, first of all, in the <laughs> in the guard, nor up until nowadays, no one has seen women there. We see, first of all, abuse of women. So, I mean, we see that women uh, are abused uh, exactly as a political tool. Uh, they're objectified. They're treated as a trophy. Okay, now I even have women to protect me. I even have women to protect me. You know. And then tomorrow, no women. And then the continuation of the same type of language and a dominant uh, um, populist uh, yes, type of discourse. Patronal patronal patronizing. Patronizing. Patronizing, yeah. But I think there is also this underlying uh, and uh, dimension uh, which is still present in our culture and that the women are a gentler sex, that women are... Um, um, we should have women in order to be more beautiful as a society and we should have women uh, around as to be enriched in that sense and not because we would be wiser, we would be more experienced, that we would be better because we would improve in every single aspect of our life. So there is that understanding, an underlying understanding of women as decoration where uh, we would expect, we, what is the underlying thought is exactly that um, uh, he implies that uh, the, the opposition leaders would behave unmanly, ungentlemanlike, if they would uh, dare to attack women, not because you know, they're skillful, better trained, uh, you know, uh, professionals in this field, but because they're uh, gentler sex. And so it would be inhuman to attack uh, a woman for that purpose. So there is that kind of, uh, even if it is, um, even if he didn't mean it, that kind of culture actually spoke <laughs> through him. Uh, yeah. So I generally speaking agree with uh, these concluding uh, remarks. However, I think that there is something else there. Mm -hmm. These governments and the, uh, the president uh, in person, they have been playing the game mm -hmm. of promoting gender mm -hmm. equality. Yeah. Yeah. Besides all of this insincere yeah, yeah. Uh, acting, Practically, yeah, yeah. declaratively speaking, they are on this side. Um, yeah, let, let, equality yeah, and, 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 and uh, I think we should conclude. I mean, I've taken too much time, but we started a bit later, Marco. So I'm sorry for for uh, for taking for taking your time um, taking time from you. I did it from your wife as well last <laughs> last week. Uh, uh, excuse myself. I I think. We are very much in many other fields in the in the game of simulation, mm -hmm. um, and um, in as much uh, as in many other fields of manipulation. So y yes, I mean uh, there is one type of discourse which looks um, like promoting, but you know uh, which is caressing you, and there is a stick uh, in, uh, in you know behind the back which is also hitting you where uh, it is not so visible so there is that kind of uh, there is that kind of game and um, and sometimes there is no even a game but it's uh, really um, uh, pure aggression um, okay thank you so much and um, i uh, give immediately the floor to marco so we can um, uh, we can hear more about uh, uh,
and we just have one comment from Imraq, and uh, she sent us this uh, about Turkey President Erdogan saying women are not equal to men. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. similar. President, President Erdogan, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for thank you all of you, and uh, and uh, uh, I give the floor to Ma. Yeah, but it, uh, it was a statement from 2014 of Erdogan, and uh, we we saw as well that uh, with the, with the change of uh, concept of uh, uh, with the downgrading of the secular state, and uh, I mean I don't want to take further more floor from Marco, but I mean there is a okay maybe as there is a reflection to what Erdogan said, uh, what what uh, Anna quoted, and. Um, also in comparison to another statement of one of our colleagues, which uh, could have been placed here, um, when he compared um, uh, that, um, uh, uh, speaking of the of Kosovo uh, statues uh, in terms which are um, um, uh, uh, hurting some people's sense of dignity would be equal as to hurting um, uh, the sense of uh, someone's sense of um, uh, dignity in terms of chastity uh, and um, uh, and sexual modesty, let's say. Um, I have to say that it's without going. It's it's a again a statement that we would have to analyze. But I have to state something in relation to what Erdogan said as well. Um, the, 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 the the European Court of Human Rights. Um, uh, uh, in the 2001, upheld the decision of the Turkish Constitutional Court to ban Refah Party. Um, and um, in that judgment, the court, European Court of Human Rights took into account as one of the reasons for banning Refah, the fact that Refah was advocating the introduction of Sharia. And the court um, rightly interpreted the introduction of Sharia as a system of uh, inequality between men and women. Um, I'm saying this because um, European Court of Human Rights is in general very open to free speech when it comes to public realm. And uh, it, it considers that everything, uh, uh, almost everything can be said in the public realm. Um, uh, and any, anyone can advocate for any type of changes in the constitution, let's say, uh, in as much as you don't use verbal violence, uh, or you're not using physical violence. Um, however, in this judgment, the court said that even, um, that some propositions are not simply possible. So Sharia is not possible because it would introduce inequality between men and women. So there are, not everything is allowed for the public realm. Um, and when I say not everything is allowed, I don't speak of the form and whether it can be considered as a hate speech. I'm considering, I'm talking of the content itself. Not everything can be said, even when it is said in the most polite way and in the most, let's say, non-aggressive way. Um, because simply uh, there are some standards um, and uh, the justice calls for the change of language uh, in a way that we achieve the social equality between men and women. So um, uh, uh, Erdogan was a member of the Refah party. He was the member of the party which was banned. Then he came to power through another party and the moment he came to power, this shows how right it was decision to ban Refah party because some of the changes in the law which he made were uh, intended to bring the whales into the public sphere and to allow uh, wearing of the whales in the public sphere. Um, uh, I won't go further into it because we discussed uh, just a one a segment of the problem of the whales last week. But uh, uh, whales definitely, when especially when a veiled woman is his wife, um, uh, and she regularly appears at uh, uh, protests with him, it definitely see, sends uh, uh, you know a kind of message to all women and men. So we we need to be uh, very much aware of the danger of these kind of messages, even when they are put in a very mild and non-aggressive way. Thank you.